Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to introduce our work, Unlocking the Power of Inline Floating Point Operations on Programmable Switches. This is a joint work of UIUC, KAUST, Microsoft Research, NUDT, and Intel. So with the recent trend of SDN and programmable hardware, the network itself, especially the networking devices, has been given more programmability. Specifically, networking switches with programmable pipeline has gained much more attention. There are already many programmable switches, such as Intel Tofino, the Broadcom Trident, and NVIDIA Spectrum. This popularity comes from the programmable switches, uh, you know, simple architecture, great flexibility with high level language like P4, and also the high line rate performance. As a result, the com community has seen a wide range of applications being offloaded or accelerated by programmable switch. These applications include, but not limited to, caching, consensus or coordination, load balancing, security, database, and also uh, distributed machine learning. Having that said, are we still missing anything in the programmable switch? In this work, we find that the floating point data format is not well supported by protocol independent switch architecture or PISA, the most popular programmable switch paradigm. Floating point is everywhere. For example, in distributed machine learning training, the workers need to exchange gradient data for model update. In some net, uh, in database query, the targeted data column can be in floating point format. In some network congestion control algorithms, floating point operations are needed for bandwidth estimation. Hence, floating point operations are really desirable in PISA switch for future application acceleration. So, in this work, we are committed to efficient floating point support on PISA switch. Obviously, one question off the top of our mind is, why does the current PISA have no floating point support? So let's see how those arithmetic operations work at the hardware level at first. For integer or say fixed point, it's easy and simple. You simply add or sub two numbers in the binary format. And regarding the hardware, both the block level and also the logic gate level are really straightforward. Only a few you know, full adders connected back to back here. Then, how about the floating point? Typically, a floating point number consists of three parts. Taking a 16-bit half-precision floating point number as an example, we have one bit sign, and also biased exponent, which is five bits in this case, and mantissa, or say significant, which is 10 bits in this case. For the sign bit, zero indicates that this one is a positive number. And for the exponent, the value represented here in binary is 17, and considering the bias, the actual exponent value should be 2. For the mantissa, it always represents a value in the range of 0 to 1. So here we have 0 0.875. And finally, all these values can be assembled by the, this formula to the represent the actual you know, float one value. Also note that since the mantissa is always normalized to the range, there is an implied one in the front of the mantissa to save more you know, storage space. Then, let's talk about the simple floating point addition operation. Let's say we want to calculate A plus B. The first step is to extract the fields from the numbers. Note that since the, in this example we are dealing with positive numbers, we just ignore the sign base for simplicity. And during the extract step, we should also recover the implied one in the mantissa so that it can represent the correct value. The next step is to align the two mantissa based on the exponent difference. To avoid precision loss, we always right shift the mantissa with smaller exponent to drop the least significant bits. Here, we will right shift the mantissa b by one bit. After alignment, we can do the actual add or sub for the two mantissa. Here, we can have the mantissa C's value. And then, we need to renormalize the mantissa C so that it can still fail into the right range. Specifically, the first one should always be at the fifth bit as the implied one, but now it's on the fourth bit. Hence, we right shift the mantissa by one bit and similarly adjust the exponent value to redirect the mantissa's change. And finally, 
we assemble this component spec to the standard floating point format, which is C equals to 10 in this case. Also note that the leading one of Mantisa is implied again. These steps make the underlying hardware extremely complicated as well. Here is a high-level block diagram of a typical floating point adder. Even a single block is really complicated. For example, the block here already represents the entire integer or say fixed point adder. In other words, a floating point operation cannot be done in a single clock cycle anyway. Then, let's take a look at the standard PISA architecture. As shown in this diagram, the programmable parser will extract the designated fields from the network packet. These fields will be fed to the programmable pipeline, and in each stage, the fields will be matched with the value stored in the, st uh, in the stage's memory, and the corresponding actions will be taken. Uh, overall, this is a fully pipeline streaming design for line rate forwarding guarantee. In each pipeline stage, only one operation can be done for a single data. Also, only one memory access to a memory location is allowed for each packet. In other words, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to push the floating point operation into a single pipeline stage. Of course, there are other programmable switch paradigms which may support floating point number easily. For example, we have the switches with some dedicated arithmetic units which can achieve high performance. But the fixed functionality leads to inflexibility of supporting emerging floating point formats, especially in machine learning uh, community. On the other hand, FPGA-based switch offers enough flexibility, but its performance remains a big concern. Hence, PISA is still the desirable platform for the purpose of balanced performance and also flexibility. So, having float mode format and PISA paradigm, how can we combine them together? In this work, we propose the F-PISA mechanism, which enables native floating point support in commodity PISA switch. Here comes our overview of the FPSA mechanism. Basically, we have three main ideas. First, we decouple the floating point representation and operations into mutual independent steps and allocate them in the, F in the PISA's pipeline stages. Second, we do, don't recover the standard floating point format in the switch until we really need it on the end host side. Third, we leverage the networking hardware for floating point operations or say sub-operations. Let me first introduce the floating point representation in PISA. Specifically, given a floating point number, how can we store it in the PISA pipeline stages? The idea is decoupling. We put the 8-bit exponent in the pipeline stage memory, and at the same time, we combine the sign bit and matissa and put them into the subsequent uh, pipeline stage. Note that this will be encoded in two's complement for convenience add or sub operation support. The next design aspect is delayed normalization. Suppose we want to aggregate three numbers in the pipeline, and we have this piece of pipeline with a single direction. We have the first value deploy in the two stages, and when the second value comes in, after calculating the mantissa. Uh, sum, we cannot re 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 renormalize it and go back to, uh, to adjust the exponent value as well. Instead, we propose to keep the temporary exponent and mantissa value inside the P P P uh, PISA switch pipeline until we really need it on the end host side. This means during the aggregation of value 1, value 2, and value 3, we simply conduct the extract align, and the add or sub, keep the aggregated mantissa as it. Until we finish the aggregation, we pull the exponent and mantissa out of the stage's memory, and then we have the following pipeline stage dealing with the renormalization and assemble steps, so that we can get the value v4 with the standard floating point format. The third idea is to use the networking hardware for floating point operations. Recall that in the normalization step, we need to count the leading, one, uh, leading zeros, which is in, in, impossible with the simple you know, ALU functionalities of current PISA. Instead, we use the uh, TCAN-based LPM table used for uh, you know, IP routing for this purpose. Let's take a closer look at this table. 
For the match field, we can have IP address with mask, and the action is to decide how to forward the packet or manipulate the packet. How is the IP address related to leading zero counting? So let's see the IP address 64.0.0.0 with a mask of two bits. In, in the binary format, it's like 10 plus 11 plus 30 doesn't care bits. Similarly, the IP address 32.0.0.0 slash 3 equals to two zeros and one one, and others are, you know, doesn't care bits. So on and so forth. In this way, we are actually emulating leading zero counting. Hence, we're building our uh, match and action table as follow, where the corresponding shift actions can guarantee the correct position of the implied one. Having this design aspect in mind, we implement PISA, a PISA architecture in P4 language on a Intel Tofino 1 silicon. We find that the current implementation is not really efficient because of some hardware limitations. First, we find that the VLIW instruction slot is saturated, limiting the number of floating point uh, operations we can have per packet. Specifically, in the table like leading zeros counting table, we have entries like this. And each action is mapped to an uh, instruction in the instruction buffer, since the count of the shift bits is hard-coded in, in each instruction. Hence, we propose a two operand shift instruction so that one left shift instruction and one right shift instruction should be enough for handling all the cases here. A second example is endless conversion. Networking device and end host CPU have different byte-wide order of data, or say endless. Our experiments show that converting such byte-wise ordering on the end host is really expensive. However, this should be cheap in the switch hardware since it's just you know, shuffling the wire connections at the circuit level. This is also our proposed uh, hardware enhancement. Our circuit level evaluation shows that our enhancement adds negligible overhead to the existing PISA architecture and is much cheaper than a standard floating point hardware unit in terms of power and area consumption. In this work, we take the distributed machine learning training as an example to evaluate FPSA's benefit. Let's take a look at the state-of-the-art method first. There will be workers' machines, each with local copy of the model and the local par partition of the uh, training data. Each training iteration, every worker machine will use the local data to train the model and generate the gradient value. Note that the gradient value here is in the floating point format natively, and we have to quantize them on the end host before the next step. Then, these gradient ve vectors will be sent out and aggregated in the network switch. The aggregated gradient vector will be broadcasted to each worker machine again, where they will be converted back to the floating point format, and for the next you know, training iteration. Due to the hardware limitation, we develop a software simulation library that behaves like FPSA's thin switch addition, and we evaluate it on multiple machine learning models training to see its impact on the model training convergence. For FPSA speed up compared to the quantization-based fixed point solution, we also leverage the state-of-the-art switch ML framework in a real cluster with real machine learning models. Let's first see the FPSAS impact on the training convergence and accuracy. We compare the end-to-end uh, end accuracy curve of uh, standard addition and FPSAS addition with both FP32 and half-precision FP16. From this plot, we can find that both FP32 and FP16, FPSAS curve highly overlaps with the standard curve. Hence, the errors introduced by the FPSA mechanism doesn't really affect the training convergence and final model accuracy. We then evaluate the training speedup. For the fixed point based switch ML, we use two or eight CPU cores for endless conversion and floating point quantization in switch ML experiments. Um, this plot shows the FPSA speedup than switch ML. When using eight CPU cores on each end host for switch ML, we observe that FPSA can, can be as high as 35% faster than switch ML. This improvement will be more significant if we have limited end host CPU resource, or say two CPU cores here. Note that this will lead to more than 40% drop regarding the training time, meaning switch ML consumes lots of hard, uh, hardware resources on the end host side. 
Hence, we argue that FP cell is a high performance and efficient approach. Due to the time limit, I'm not able to cover every aspect of our work. Please refer to our paper for more details. To recap, during the design and implementation complexity, today's, uh, today's PISA-based programmable switch typically do not support floating point operations, which are common and important in many distributed and networking applications. To this end, we propose FPISA, along with a few hardware enhancements that enables PISA pipeline to, order, uh, to, operation, uh, to operate floating point data natively with an acceptable approximation. Using distributed machine learning training as an example, we demonstrate that compared to the state-of-the-art fixed-point-based solution, FPSA-based in-network aggregation can significantly reduce the, both the training time and also the end-host resource consumption. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.